have a testable, empirically, theoretically based hypothesis, we can start to consider how we're going to go about testing this. And this is when we start to design our methodology for our data collection. So in data collection, we're really interested in three big chunks. We're interested in who our participants are, what measures we'll be using, and what procedures we'll be doing to get the participants to fill out those measures. Now, data is always plural in psychology. Um, oh, that's funny. I have data is, but I should have data are. So data are always a plural. Uh, so the word data is a plural, data are a plural. Have I lost you yet? It's okay. So data are valuable and data were collected. That's the proper way to say it. You wouldn't say data is valuable or data was collected because that's making it sound like a singular. Uh, a singular of data is datum, so the datum is valuable. And so when we think about a data set, it's full of many datums or data. Just, just to introduce you to that. So in terms of the participants, uh, in most psychology studies, it may come to a shock, but Throughout the history of psychological science in North America, nearly all of our studies, a uh, large percentage of our studies have actually relied on participants that were studying psychology in university. Undergraduate psychology students and some graduate psychology students have been the main body of participants for a very long time in psychology. They remain one of the most popular types of participant pools in psychology. For many decades, they were the only ones we studied. Now, there are a few other types of participants we examine, of course, uh, such as clinical patients through outpatients or inpatients at the hospital or community centers. Sometimes also community volunteers that we recruit um, based on not through the university, but through ads on social media or ads uh, through other community networks. Perhaps we're interested in, in examining new moms. We might go to a, a maternity center and recruit new moms, or might want to go to a rehabilitation center, or we might want to go to people experiencing addictions and go to an addiction center, what have you. We also recruit children through schools if we're doing developmental studies. We also may recruit uh, prisoners who are in the jail system if we're doing forensic psychology studies. And of course, there are many psychological studies on animals, so non-human animals, such as ferrets, hamsters, rats, uh, lemurs, uh, and to an extent, some monkeys. And so based on what your hypothesis is, you may have different types of ideas for who your participants will be. If you're interested in studying preferences in sports teams, maybe you'll just tap into preferences in sports teams and undergraduate psychology students. Maybe you want to go to the community and recruit at a sports stadium uh, as they're and as they're leaving the game and get kind of their feel for how they choose their favorite sports teams. After we choose our participants, it's important to look at the measures. And so there's many different ways that we can measure psychological phenomena. Some of the most popular include things like physiological tests. So this is when we measure things on the body. We may use a, a brain imagery to measure reactions within the brain. We may also test saliva or test skin conductivity on the skin. We may test blood pressure or eye dilation. There's many types of physiological tests. We also do cognitive tests like intelligence tests or word vocabulary tests or reaction time tests. We could also do things that have no right or wrong, like attitude surveys, ask people about their personality or their preferences or their lifestyle. We may also engage in long open-ended interviews where we allow people to talk in more of an open format. We may conduct observations where we bring people into the laboratory and we may not ask them to do things, but we may just observe them, interact with others, or we may give them a puzzle and watch how they interact and do the puzzle. We may also do things where we don't collect our own data, but we go out and we perform archival research. That is, we find a data set that's already been collected and we analyze what is in the archives. We, may also, archi we also can do archival research on things that are online. So for example, you could download uh, the API on Twitter and analyze different social media uh, things online. Anything that's in the public record could be done through archival research. And finally, there's case studies. Case studies could be where you just examine one person uh, in detail and get a full holistic view of their life. Now, in terms of, of variables, this is once you've decided how you're going to measure things, it's important to understand what you're actually testing in your study. And by virtue, all psychological studies should have at least two variables. 
They are the independent and the dependent variable. Now these come with lots of different types of names. The independent variable is also known as the IV, stands for independent variable, but is also called the predictor variable, or also called the cause, the cause to be effect. So that's really the starter. And then we have the dependent variable, also called the DV, also called the outcome or the effect. So it's really the, the where things go. So the independent variable should cause the dependent variable, that is the dependent variable depends on the independent variable, or the independent variable causes the effect in the dependent variable, or what have you. So let's say, for example, we want to study if there is a link between driving and having car, car collisions and use of cannabis. We may identify one of those as an independent variable and one of those as a dependent variable. Uh, in most cases, we would probably say that we don't expect car collisions to cause cannabis usage, but perhaps we would expect cannabis usage to perhaps cause or predict uh, car collisions. It might be the case that if somebody's under the influence of cannabis, they may have more car collisions. You may disagree with that hypothesis, but it could still be a testable hypothesis. Aside from the independent and dependent variables, we also have the extraneous variables. These are also called distractor or confounding variables. So these are things that may muddy the waters, that make studying the relationship between uh, cannabis and car collisions a bit more complex. You may have already been thinking, well, wait a minute, what? I don't think cannabis would cause a car collision if, and under those if conditions are our extraneous variables. So let's talk about our extraneous or confounding variables in a little bit more detail. Sometimes we find confounding variables uh, that are pretty stable and we might find it easier to measure and statistically control them. For instance, you may feel that the um, relation between cannabis usage and car collisions is different if one person is driving during the day in the sunny weather or driving during rainy weather or driving during night where it's really dark. And so you may say, well, I think cannabis will only influence car collisions when it's rainy or when it's dark, not when it's sunny. That is very important. And so what we could do with that confounding variable is we can statistically control for it. So that's easy. We can statistically control it. But there's other types of confounding variables that may be a little bit different. You might actually say there could be individual differences that influence the relation between cannabis and driving collision. For instance, maybe gender, maybe height, maybe body weight, maybe experience driving, or maybe experience using cannabis, uh, maybe tolerance to cannabis, maybe nervousness. So there might be lots of little individual differences. So amongst those individual differences, let's say we're interested in how men versus women might differ under the influence of cannabis when they're driving. We might identify that gender may play a major role. So in that situation, we might not statistically control it. Instead, we may do what's measure and match. And that is, we make sure we have equal numbers of men and women. And so we're studying equal numbers of men and women rather than excluding one gender so that we can measure and match the difference to see if there is a gender difference use, looking at the role of cannabis in driving collisions. And finally, there might be some other confounding variables that we just maybe need to uh, exclude altogether. So let's assume that what if a person is not just under the influence of cannabis, but they're under the influence of some other uh, psychoactive substances, uh, perhaps uh, methamphetamines, opiates, cocaine, alcohol, uh, barbiturates. Maybe they're under the influence of some medications. Maybe they're under the influence of some ADHD medication, anxiety medication, sleep medication, which would also alter and influence if they experience a car collision. So in that type of situation, we would again need to exclude. But with exclusion, we may just toss it out completely. If anybody's under the influence of anything in addition to cannabis, they can't participate. Uh, they, they, we just wouldn't include them in our data set because if they're also in the influence of opiates, we know there's going to be a, a link between opiates and driving usage, so we don't include them. Now this can be difficult. Uh, sometimes people are not going to admit to the driving usage. Sometimes there's so many individual differences in body weight and potency and tolerance that's impossible to match. And sometimes there's so many possibilities of weather. I mean, uh, you could be, it could be sunny for part of the drive and cloudy for part of the drive. So this may be too difficult. So then what we could do is move to random assignment. Random assignment is when we try to assume under the assumptions of mathematics that if we randomly collect people that these attributes should all be 
uh, distributed in, in a certain type of mathematical spectrum, we'll get to in a bit, called the normal curve. And so tolerance for cannabis and nervousness while driving and opiate usage and sunniness and raininess should all vary to an extent that if we just get enough people in our study, there'll be um, a variance in that. And if we, if we collect enough from enough people, we can randomly assign people to our study and it should balance out all these individual variations so that all these confounding variables will be controlled through the randomness of math. It'll make more sense when we start talking about different groups in our analysis. So just hang with me on that.